Right, so, come on, go away. Go away. Right, so uh, first let me introduce myself. My name is Sam Blitz. I am your instructor for 9B. So if you're not here for 9B, uh, I don't want to say go away, but you know, that's not what you're here for. Um, so I'm a grad student in the physics department. I've been doing my PhD for five years or so. So, you know, I know what I'm talking about, but I do not have a doctorate yet. I will in, in a year or two. Um, so don't call me Dr. Blitz. That's why my mom goes by anyway. Don't call me Mr. Blitz. Makes me feel old. I'm still in my 20s, so don't. Don't do that. Um, just call me Sam. It's the ideal uh, arrangement. Um, hopefully everybody has access to Canvas. Uh, if you don't, you can shoot me an email. My email address is shblitz, won't tell you what the middle initial H stands for, at UC Davis. That's it, UC Davis dot edu. Right, that's my email address. That's the email that you should be, it's not Herbert. <laughs> That's the email address that you should be sending emails to if you do have questions. Um, ideally, send administrative emails there. Uh, physics questions, you know, uh, this actually segues nicely. There's a Discord where physics questions are going to be your most, uh, you're going to be able to ask the most phys physics questions there. Um, I would highly recommend everybody sign up for the Discord. Right now, I think we have something like, uh, let me actually pull it up right now. Something like 40, seven, which is just over half of the people. So if you guys want the uh, the channel, let me see if I can open it up. No, why is it hidden? Okay, well, I did send out a Canvas announcement that has a link to the Discord in it. Highly recommend it. Um, I started using a Discord last quarter over this, in the spring for students to ask questions and collaborate with each other. And a lot of students found it super helpful. It was like a great way to get homework help from your fellow students. It was like a, almost like a physics study room. And you know, I would pop in every once in a while and answer questions. So do check this out. Uh, I promise if we can get the majority of you guys in here, it'll be super helpful. Um, so I'll right, check it out here. Um, I don't have office hours yet. I'll probably post those later tonight. I wanted to make sure that everybody, uh, the, the, the link to the Discord is, there, there's an announcement on Canvas with a link. Um, for some reason, even though I'm an admin, it won't actually show me the invite link code. It just lets me copy it to my clipboard. So uh, whatever, I'll, but, but there is an announcement on Canvas with a link in it. It should also be in the syllabus as well. Right, uh, there's another thing. So you guys all know the lecture, lectures are because you're here. Um, however, on Wednesdays, as you hopefully noted in the syllabus, there will be quizzes at the beginning of every lecture from 10 to 10.20. These will be available on Gradescope um, hopefully you guys have opened up Gradescope and checked it out, see how it works. Um, thank you. Um, <clears throat> no, you don't have to put your real name. It makes it easier to be anonymous and ask dumb questions, right? <laughs> um, there are no dumb questions, but you know, if you feel like you're, uh, yeah, you don't, you don't have to put your real name. Although if you do ask me a question about something administrative on Discord, like you could message me, but then I'll need to know your real name so I can like figure out what's going on. Anyway, <clears throat> right. So there'll be quizzes from 10 to 1020 every Wednesday. There'll be multiple choice quizzes. They'll be testing you on concepts that we covered since then, uh, or rather up until that Wednesday. Um, these are starting this week. So um, they're basically just timed 10 minute or uh, 20 minute long, multiple choice questions, mul multiple, multiple choice quizzes, 10 minute or 10 questions each. Um, this week, because there's not a whole lot of course material to go over, you can expect the quiz questions to be both on material today and on the syllabus. So make sure you've read through the syllabus in its entirety because, you know, I'm going to ask you questions about the syllabus on the quiz. Um, you know, it's super important. Um, I, have, I have a very strict anti-cheating or not, no cheating, no academic dishonesty policy that is in the syllabus, but I want to outline it here so you guys heard it from the horse's mouth. Um, the homeworks are graded for correctness. They're graded as if they are exams. That means that you cannot go to Chegg and look up solutions for them. If you are caught doing so, you will be reported to, this, to the Office of Student Services and Judicial Affairs or whatever. Like, like there's no first time amnesty, you will be reported to them. And if you are uh, determined to have copied from Chegg, you will, be fail, you, you will fail the course. So putting this out there, last, last quarter I had issues with up to half of my students, half of 180 or so, all copying from Chegg to get answers. Don't do that. If you need help, come to office hours, go to the Discord, shoot me a message, but don't copy because you don't learn anything. And these are, you know, um, copyrighted questions. So uploading them to check is not only against student policy, it's also illegal. So 
please, please, please don't do that. I don't want to have to deal with the same thing I dealt with last quarter. Um, right. Um, trying to think if there are any other, oh yes, your TAs, uh, do we need to, no, 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 no. It's, it's going to be a completely online, you're going to click radio buttons on the website. You're not going to have to write anything. It's just clicking buttons on the website. It should be really, really easy. I haven't set it up yet. So this first quiz, I may or may not make a count. We'll see. But um, it should be very easy for you guys. You just go on to your browser, click a bunch of things, and then you're done. Um, right. So the other thing is discussions. So discussions are going to be either Monday or Wednesday or Tuesday or Thursday, depending on which section you're in. Um, discussion attendance isn't mandatory, although the TA is a wonderful person. He's a good friend of mine. Um, so, you know, check him out. He's a, he's a neat dude. Um, he's the person who introduced me to Rick and Marty. So, you know, whatever. Um, but, but, uh, you don't have to go to the discussion sections. However, during each discussion, there will be a discussion worksheet that you're expected to work through. Now, if you attend the discussion zoom meetings, you're going to be working with, with your fellow classmates and with the discussion TA on working out those solutions. However, if you don't go, you have to work them out yourself. They don't have to be necessarily correct, but you have to at least try. These are, this is basically a way of taking attendance on an online discussion medium. Um, <clears throat> so discussions will be Monday, Wednesday, or Tuesday, Thursday, and then you will be expected to hand in or submit on Gradescope with a, like, with a PDF, take a picture with your phone, convert it to a PDF, submit it on Gradescope, um, your answers to these discussion questions. Um, these will be due on Thursday following the discussion, the Monday or Tuesday discussion, and the following Monday following the Wednesday, Thursday discussion. Now there's only eight discussion worksheets this quarter, but there are 11 discussion sections. So occasionally I'll send out an announcement saying that, look, there's no discussion worksheet this week. And you can check when those weeks are by checking when the discussion worksheets become available on Canvas. But um, you can just watch out for those emails. There won't be a discussion due every week. Um, good question, Chelsea. Um, I'm not going to assign readings. However, my lecture notes, these guys, um, are based on the same set of notes that were used to write, uh, yeah, the, the discussion worksheets are the same for all sections. Um, my lecture notes are used based on the same notes that were used to write the textbook, the online textbook uh, on LibreText. Um, so my notes are going to be very, very similar to the textbook. Sometimes things will be out of order. Sometimes I'll have some additional things. Sometimes I'll leave some things out. But um, if you are having trouble following along with my lectures, or if you need some additional material, go check out the Libre text. Um, the material is almost entirely the same. I'm just presenting my own twist to it and hopefully answering questions along the way. Um, yeah, you, you, so I would advise sticking with just your one section, uh, but I suppose you could. I don't see why you wouldn't be able to. That's not a bad idea um, if you do need more help. However, the discussions, like, you're, the discussion worksheets will not be graded on correctness. They're graded for complete for completeness, as it says in the syllabus. Now, just one more thing before we actually jump in, because we're already 10 minutes in. Um, homeworks. So homework is due every Monday at noon. Uh, it will be covering material from the previous Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Uh, there's one Friday that's a uh, holiday, so we won't have lecture that day. Um, I believe I made it 60-40 or 50-50. But part of the grade that you receive for the homework will be based on completeness. Did you actually try to do all of the problems? The other part will be, will be treated as if it's like an exam or a quiz question. So make sure that um, for all of the problems, you are answering, you know, fully explaining all of your work and so on, because one of them, or two of them, I will choose without telling you which one, um, will be graded for correctness. Now, that means that you should be shooting to be correct on all of your homework problems. However, some of them are going to be hard. Like, like you guys have probably seen my rate, my professor, I assign hard homeworks and hard exams. Um, that's not a bad thing though, especially because for the homeworks, you can get help. Like in the discord, ask questions, uh, come to me and I will walk you through the homeworks, come to my office hours, um, whatever you should, you should be able to get almost full points on all of the homeworks, assuming you seek out the help that you might need. Um, <clears throat> Regarding exams, I do curve generously, even if they are hard. And you'll find that the average grade uh, last quarter at the end of the at the end of the quarter was something like a B minus. Um, so I curve pretty gen pretty generously. Anyway, with regards to lectures, I know it's long. Um, it's an hour and a half. Uh, I'd love to have a break in in the middle for you guys, but unfortunately, there's just so much material to get through. Um, as for questions during the lectures, um, feel free to ask them. 
but try not to, uh, A, try not to ask questions that have already been asked because it just takes up more time. Uh, B, unless it's an urgent question, like you, 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 like you, like you can always save it till the end, right? And I can answer it then. But um, I just, last time I opened up lectures for questions like this, the first lecture, I got like 30 questions in the first 10 minutes. And that just meant that I couldn't get through all the material I wanted to get through. That said, I will always stick around for like 10 to 30 minutes after lecture to answer any questions and just chat and help you guys out with whatever. It's not really a time for homework help. It's more of just a time for making sure that you solidify your understanding, but I'll be around. And again, I'm around on, I'm around on Discord um, and then there's going to be office hours and so on. Um, right, so does anyone have any administrative type questions before we jump in up to the actual course material? Ah, good question. Um, so basically, uh, there's a set of lab manuals uh, or a lab manual that's available online. You can get see a link in the syllabus. Uh, sorry, yeah, you're right. I should have covered that. I'm not really responsible for lab. That's kind of a separate part of the course that doesn't really deal with me. I will do my best to keep up and like be aligned with the lab, and I'll let the lab coordinator know if we're not uh, on, if we're not coinciding. But basically. There will be a set of labs that you can submit on Canvas. Um, those are the only things not submitted through Gradescope. And uh, basically, if you did the lab and did everything in it and you showed effort, you will get full credit. If you don't, you will not get full credit. If you don't get full credit on like three or more, then you fail the lab and you fail the course. So do your labs. They really aren't supposed to take very long, like maybe half an hour or an hour or something like that. It, it shouldn't be that bad. All right. Um, I think I'm going to jump in because we're 15 minutes in already and we haven't started. So let's do that. Yeah, no, no, there's, there's no lab meeting. It's, it's all done at home, which kind of sucks for a lab course, but you know, coronavirus, right? 20, 2020 is, 2020 is a hell of a year. Right. So, <clears throat> oh, by the way, I'll be uploading these lecture notes, um, just because some people like to have them, but you should still take notes. It's a useful part of learning. So. Hopefully you guys already know kind of what this course is about. Um, we're going to talk about thermodynamics later, but we're starting with waves. So let's try to answer the question, what is a wave? I think Ollie's looking around. So I can give you a definition, and I guess I'll just do that. A wave is a disturbance that propagates by the way, I'm sorry that like this isn't as dynamic as like a regular lecture. I know that it's annoying. It's just like black on white and whatever, but it's the best I can do. It, so it's a disturbance that propagates. Oh, and if you can't read my handwriting, let me know. I got feedback last quarter that my handwriting was perfectly fine, but you never know. Uh, it's a disturbance that propagates through space at a constant speed. Now, all of these things, all of these things I've underlined are very important for a wave to be a wave. If something that looks like a wave changes speed <clears throat> through a given medium, it's not a wave. It has to be propagating at a constant speed. So we all know a whole bunch of examples of waves, hopefully. Uh, ocean waves. By the way, I'm very surprised that there's only 60 of you in here when there's 81 people enrolled in the course. Uh, sound is a wave. You may have heard of sound waves before. Uh, and then light is also a wave. Also, it's kind of not a wave. Quantum mechanics is weird, sorry about that. Um, and this is all fine and good, but it's useful to be able to describe these things mathematically, right? Physics is basically you take real world problems and you translate them into math. So we're gonna try to do that. So mathematically, We know that f of x, say, where x is a position, measures, or it could measure, a disturbance measured by, say, the value of f of x at a position x. Now, I know that the word disturbance seems kind of vague here, and I'll try to clarify what that means in a bit. Um, oh, my headset just turned off, but you guys can still hear me because it's camera audio. Uh, however, 
this is not just enough to, to describe a wave. You may have seen things like sine of x and think, oh, that's a wave. Well, it's not, right? Because waves also move through time. So uh, we need more. We need to describe how they move in time. Um, i.e. there should be some sort of time dependence in our mathematical description. So what do we know? We know that waves move at a constant speed. So that means that every quote unquote t seconds, the wave moves a distance a distance of vt, right? Multiply rate times time, you get distance that the wave travels. It moves vt units in the x direction. This is not, say, the up and down motion of the wave. This is how the wave actually travels from, say, left to right. Uh, by the way, this v, that is the speed of propagation. And it's a constant, right? Because waves travel at constant speed. You know, I was really looking forward to actually lecturing in person over the summer, bummer that I don't get to. Um, anyway, so now we have the tools, right? Um, so we can write, we can mathematically describe a wave, f of x and t, and we know it has to depend on both position and, uh, and time. This can be written as a function of x minus or plus v times t. Now, let, let's, let's look at this formula, right? We know, or hopefully you guys remember from pre-calc, that if you say have a formula like x minus five squared, what that means is it's just a parabola shifted over five units, right? So by subtracting off v times t, what we're saying is after time t seconds, we shift our wave over x v times t units. And that's exactly what a wave does, right? It moves v t in, in a, in t seconds. Now, notice that I have this minus plus. That's just to indicate what direction it travels, right? If I subtract off five here, that means it moves five units to the right. If I added five, it would move five units to the left. So the whole point here is we can, we can describe motion to the left or to the right. With a minus sign, we have motion to the left, or sorry, motion to the right. And with a plus sign, we have motion to the left. So any one-dimensional wave will, set, will have a formula like this. So let me give you a few examples. By the way, this is a weird notation. I'm kind of abusing it because one of these f's has two variables and one of them only has one. Um, I'm just using the same letter to indicate that they're related, but don't, tr don't try to like relate how f of x and t how like the x relates to the x part of f of x minus vt, they're, it's just a notation. Um, examples, right? So f of x and t might be written as sine of x minus 3t. That's a perfectly fine wave, right? Because it has a time dependence, it has a space dependence, and it moves at a constant speed. In particular, this wave would be a sine wave that moves at three units per second to the right. Another example, g of x and t. How about just x plus 5t? Now, this, is, this one's strange, right? Because it just looks like a line. It just looks like a line. But that line moves to the left at a certain speed. It'll move to the left at a speed of 5 units per second. Third example, just to solidify the concept. Something complicated. How about the exponential function? This is e to that, but it'll take up a lot of space of negative x plus 19t squared all inside the e. So this is e to the quantity negative x plus 19t squared. Uh, so this actually represents a Gaussian curve that's moving to the left at a speed of 19 units per second. Uh, that's just a particular shape. You don't have to know that. but. The point is, is they all have this x minus plus v times t form. Though that's what makes it a wave. Now, it's not always easy to see that a function has that uh, type of formulation. Uh, you'll see probably on the homework that I will introduce um, that I'll, I'll, I'll ask you to check whether a function is a wave. One way that you can check it is see if you can write it in a form that looks like x minus plus vt. 
by the way, the reason I use minus plus instead of plus minus is just because minus means to the right. And we usually say that to the right is, a, is like the first thing. So it's just convention. Right, so there's another way to check if a function describes a wave. So that is by using the wave equation. So the wave equation is actually the thing that defines a wave. Everything that satisfies the wave equation is a wave. So the wave equation is, obviously it's an equation, it's a differential equation. Um, <clears throat> but the bottom line, the reason why we care about it is if f of x, if f of x, sorry, f of x and t is a wave, and by the way, I'm just going to identify this formula, this function that describes a wave with the wave itself. They're, they're conceptually identical. If f, of, if f of x and t is a wave with speed v, then this statement is true. Oh no, he is grumpy. You guys hear that? The second partial derivative of f with respect to x is equal to 1 divided by v squared, that is the wave speed, times the second partial derivative of x with respect to t. Do you want to go out? I'm going to let him out. I think he's grumpy. And I left him in here. Go ahead. Right, so this thing is the wave equation. So basically, you guys know how to take partial derivatives. Um, <clears throat> you guys know how to take partial derivatives. You've all, you're all taking, or you've all taken 21c. So you, you have a function f of x and t. Take two partial derivatives with respect to x. If that's equal to two part, or one divided by v squared times two partial derivatives with respect to t, then it's a wave. And you can probably pretty easily check that if you plug this f into that formula with f having the form f of x minus plus vt, it's true. So these two things are equivalent. If it satisfies this formula, then it satisfies this formula, and vice versa. Actually, um, a second statement is not quite, quite true, and I'll get in, go into detail why that's the case later. Anyway, um, so let's speed right along. So what does this formula actually mean? Well, we, we know that the first derivative is the slope. The second derivative, with respect to position anyway, that tells you whether things concave up or concave down, right? So this term tells us the concavity of the wave. And this term, well, that's like, two time derivatives with respect, or sorry, two derivatives with respect to time. That's the acceleration. So the wave equation just says that, look, the concavity of the wave is related to how, is, is related to the rate at which the wave accelerates up and down, for example. Those two things are related and that's what, that's what makes a wave a wave. Now, there are some properties of waves that you should probably be familiar with. By the way, today we're just basically covering mathematical properties of waves. We'll get into physical waves later. Um, so waves can repeat themselves. Those are probably the most familiar waves to you guys. Um, these are called periodic waves. Periodic meaning repeating themselves. Um, and so you might ask the question, how do you know if a wave is periodic. And it's actually fairly easy. You just kind of look at it. So there are two ways that you could just look at it. One is by taking a snapshot. So you basically just freeze the wave in time and then look at what it looks like, how it changes in space. So the vertical axis might be f of x and t being a fixed constant t, horizontal axis being x, and maybe your wave looks something like this. Well, OK, it's repeating itself in space. So this is a good indication that it's probably periodic. You could also look at, it at, a, look at the wave at a fixed position. That would be like you fix the location that you're looking at, and you instead look at how the 
how that particular location on the wave moves up and down, say, with time. And so maybe there it looks like this. Okay, that's a terrible example because it doesn't look periodic. And if you saw that, you would say, oh, it's periodic. It's repeating itself in time. So in fact, if you see either of these things, then you would know that that wave is periodic. And they're just two separate ways of looking at the same type of phenomenon. We can translate this, though, this periodicity property into mathematics fairly easily. So what does it mean for a wave to be periodic? It means that something about like the shape of the wave stays the same even if you wait a certain amount of time or if you travel a certain distance. So what that means, oh no, it's happening again. What that means is the disturbance f of x minus plus vt at one instant in time and space should be equal to f of x minus plus vt plus some amount. So this thing is a fixed constant, this delta. It's just some number. And this n is just a number. It's just negative 2 or negative 1 or 0 or 1 and so on. So the point is, is if this statement is true for every possible value of n, that means that the disturbance repeats itself because you're adding uh, some number. And you're adding twice that number and three times that number and four times that number. And it's always the same. And that has to be true for every x, for every t, and for every n. Um, but if that's true, and sometimes it's fairly obvious that that's true, like for example with a sine wave, then that wave can be described by that wave can be described as periodic. Um, the point this delta just tells you the smallest distance over which it or the smallest distance or the smallest time over which it repeats itself. Uh, we'll see later what that what that uh, that, that that constant is called. Now periodic waves have special properties. And they're going to be the, the waves that we study the most frequently, probably. So one property that they have is they have a wavelength. And that wavelength is often given the name, it's given the name lambda, Greek letter lambda. It's like the equivalent of um, L. And this is the distance between repeated patterns. So in fact, this is actually what that delta represents. That delta is the wavelength. They also have a period called t. This is the amount of time. before the pattern repeats. Now, you could probably, I hope, figure out how, from this formula up here, how the period relates to the wavelength. And we'll get to that. I'll do it in a little bit, deep, little bit of detail in a minute. And then there's the frequency, called f. This is how many times per second? does the pattern cycle, or does the pattern repeat? By the way, this, this uh, quantity frequency is, has a unit of hertz. The other quantities should be fairly straightforward. Wavelength, it's a distance, so it's meters, say. Period is an amount of time. Um, so it's in seconds. Uh, frequency has units of hertz. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, traveling waves and periodic, well, so all periodic waves are traveling waves. Not all traveling waves are periodic waves. Periodic waves are just a type of wave, but all waves should travel. Uh, there's like kind of one exception that we'll get to later. Um, it turns out that all these properties are related. Well, and, and the speed. And they're related mathematically. Um, so, for example, it, re it repeats, it repeats itself after t units of time.
and it repeats itself after it travels lambda units of space or lambda units of distance. So we can, we can say then that there should be a relationship between this period and this wavelength to the speed at which the wave is traveling, right? Because we know that V is the amount of time it travels, sorry, is the amount of distance it travels in a time T or in one second, say. So we can relate all of these things. We have, a, we have a distance, we have a speed, and we have a time. So we get that the wave travels and we know that it repeats itself, by the way, after that amount of time. So we can relate the speed to these quantities. V equals lambda over T. Um, a single cycle, here's another example. A single cycle, cycle is one repeat of the pattern, takes one period to occur. And we wanted to know how many, and the frequency tells us how many times per second that cycle happens. So that tells us that the frequency is just one divided by the period. It's just the inverse. And so that those two equations together give us another equation, that V is lambda times F. Note, by the way, that one hertz, or that hertz, is inverse seconds. They're the same thing. It's just this named after a guy. Um, <clears throat> now, one more property of waves. We talked about periodic waves, but not always are periodic. However, there's another property of waves that's important. This is the polarization of a wave. So despite what you may think, waves aren't always displacement waves. Now, what do I mean by displacement waves? They're just waves that move, that move in space, like up and down. Like a wave on a string, it's the string moves up and down, right? Um, they're not always displacement waves. There are other types of waves. However, they do always have a direction. Now, I do not mean the direction that the wave travels in. So let's think back up to a wave, say, on a string, right? So a wave on a string, if, if I'm drawing a picture on, on the string, the wave on the, the direction of the wave is up and down, right? And the string moves to the right. However, not all waves are actually displacement of material, say, perpendicular to the actual motion of the wave. There are other types of waves. In fact, um, I have a picture, or I have a... I have a, come on, work for me. I have a little GIF. Oh boy. I don't know why this isn't going away. Um, hide video panel. Hide floating medium controls. There we go. Um, sorry, my tablet's sometimes very slow. Nope, that's not what I wanted. How do I reopen them? Oh boy. Zoom. Oh boy, where'd the video controls go? Well, having some technical difficulties here. Come on. I didn't want to hide everything. One sec. Let me see if I can get this working. Using a mouse. Clarify, all periodic waves are traveling waves. Yes. There's got to be a way to open up Zoom, right? Oh, I hate this a lot. 
Okay, I'm gonna close out of my notes and maybe it'll reopen the, there we go. Okay, it reopened. Um, okay, gotta not do that again, but let me reopen it again. Sorry about this, guys. Never had that issue before. Um, well, let me show you the, uh, the thing I was going to show you anyway while my notes are reopening. So another type of wave that you may not have seen before is, uh, <coughs> Is called are, are, are called longitudinal waves. So look at look at this picture here, this GIF on the right. Um, you can see that there's clearly something traveling at a constant speed, but it's not like a thing moving vertically. What's happening is you have the instead of the uh, instead of the particles moving up and down, say, what you have is the density of the particles getting higher and lower periodically in space and time. And that's another type of wave. This is called a compression wave. You can also note that a given particle isn't actually moving along the waves. It's just moving back and forth in this uh, bottom image. That's a different type of wave, and it's actually a very common type of wave. In fact, that's, a, that's how sound waves occur. Um, but okay, let's get back to the, uh, oh boy, oh boy. My tablet's very slow. It's getting old. Um, let me share my notes again, so then we can get back to the lecture. Sorry for the technical difficulties, I know that's annoying. All right, let me open up the chat and the thing, there we go. If we model these waves mathematically, does that mean they aren't functions of position? No, they are, they are certainly functions of position because notice that where the compression was the most was also dependent on the location, right? Like the, the, the compression of, or the density of the gases depended both on how long had, had elapsed and on where that, uh, where that compression is. So this, this F, what, what I'm trying to get at is that this F here doesn't necessarily represent position. It could represent something like density, but that density might change at various positions and times. So that would just be another example. Uh, this is a compression wave. However, notice that the compression did have a difference. The compression waves, um, <clears throat> there was a direction. They moved. Uh, or, or they, they moved left, like, like the individual particles moved left and right. And so this tells us about the polarization of the wave. This is an example, or so, so <clears throat> what we have for, uh, in order to determine the polarization of a displacement wave, like a string, it's fairly obvious, right? Because it's just the direction that the objects move. And it, for a displacement wave, say this is, this is y, say, and this is x, the direction that the displacement occurs in is vertical, it's in the y direction. For compression waves, it's less obvious how to figure out the polarization or the direction of the wave, the associated direction of the wave. So what we can do is we can talk about directional gradients. Directional gradients are what describe the polarization or the direction of the wave for longitudinal waves. And longitudinal waves, by the way, are, um, and I'll, I'll explain them in a minute, an example of a longitudinal wave is a sound wave, like you just saw. Um, and another example of, uh, the, how do I want to phrase this? And you'll see this in 9C, by the way, but um, electric, uh, electromagnetic waves are also waves, but they're not displacements in any physical sense. But they do tell us the direction for an electromagnetic wave the polarization of the wave is the direction of the electric field, which has a, it, like it's, it has a direction, it's, it's a vector. So this whole business of polarization versus the propagating direction, they're two different concepts, but they're related. For transverse polarization, that's one type of polarization. Trans oh, that's a, a horribly unstraight line. Transverse polarization is has its displacement, quote unquote, displacement direction perpendicular to the motion or perpendicular 
to the direction of travel. So the good example here is a wave on a string, like, like, I've, drawn up, like I've drawn above. The displacement occurs vertically, whereas the wave is traveling to the right, so they're perpendicular. However, there's also longitudinal polarizations. A longitudinally polarized wave, oh, why can't I draw a straight line anymore? It's a skill that apparently you lose after like fifth grade, means that the direction of the polarization is parallel to the direction of travel. So a good example of this would be a sound wave. And that's because there is a gradient, or there is a directional gradient, if I would draw a sound wave, And we'll talk about sound in a bit, by the way. There is a clear directional gradient. The, the amount of compression, say, is changing from left to right, but also the wave is moving from left to right. Hence, it's, a longi it's longitudinally polarized. I know that this is tricky, and once we get to more examples and we start seeing why this is relevant, it'll become, it'll become more straightforward. Um, but just keep in mind, that's what transverse the, uh, polarization is the direction that the actual objects move, like, say the actual physical string moves up and down, or the actual physical um, uh, air molecules move left and right in the same direction that the wave travels. The polarization tells you the direction that the wave, that the disturbance changes in. And the speed just tells you the direction, or the, the velocity just tells you the direction that the um, propagation or that the disturbance moves. It moves from left to right. Right, so I know that's a lot. We're going to slightly change gears. We're, uh, in your example, didn't the string have no velocity? Uh, no, the string's certainly moving to the right in this case. Yeah, so, so I, I drew a snapshot. Um, I didn't, I didn't, because it's hard to draw 3D. But imagine that the string is moving to the right. Then the string is, at, the physical string is, oh boy, the physical string is moving up and down, right? A single point on the string will move vertically whereas the whole waveform itself will move to the right. So this is all a whole bunch of stuff, but it doesn't really let us talk explicitly about any type of wave. So we're gonna talk about the simplest type of wave now. These are known as harmonic waves. And these are probably the things that you think of when you think of waves. This is the simplest wave motion. Um, there are sines and cosines. And so when I say the word harmonic, that's just a synonym for sines and cosines. The, the name harmonic comes from some deeper field or some, some deeper, deeper theory of differential equations. It's just a historical name. Um, something to do with harmony and all that business. Now, we might... We might want to write, if we were to try to write down a sine or a cosine, that's a harmonic wave, might want to write the following. Let's say, you might want to say that f of x and t is cosine of x plus, say, 3 meters per second, this is just an example, times t, and that's it. But that's, that's not right. It's, it's not a sensible thing to write because units matter. So the point here is that cosine and sine as well can only have unitless arguments. And that's because angles don't have units and cosines and sines take it taken as angles as their uh, inputs. So somehow we have to convert this, this position x and this uh, position or uh, times time times velocity t or vt into an angle somehow. Well, what's the fix? How do, we, how do we fix this? Because we know that it should have x minus plus vt, but we need to change something a little bit. We divide the whole argument. By the way, the argument's the input for a cosine or sine. Oh boy, technical difficulties. Divide the whole argument. by the appropriate units, right? If we want to convert 
um, something with units of distance to something with no units, you just divide by distance. So if we divide the whole thing by meters, say one meter, then it would work out. Then, then you're at your, uh, you would have x divided by one meter, which is a unitless number. You have three meters per second times the time divided by a meter, that's also unitless. The question is, is how many meters? How many meters do you divide by? Well, you could divide by any amount and it would be a wave, but we want to divide by a certain amount so that it has the right properties. So do you guys see that? It's crazy. So let's consider a snapshot at say t equals zero, just for simplicity. So a cosine would look something like this, right? This is cosine of x because t is zero. And we know that it repeats itself after two pi units of x, right? Well, that's all fine and dandy, but we don't want our wave to repeat itself every two pi meters. We want it to repeat itself every lambda meters, lambda being the wavelength. So if we just divided by one meter, then we would get this phenomenon where the wavelength is exactly two pi but we want to divide it by a different number that makes the wavelength lambda. So how do we do that? Well, if we divide, if, how do I want to phrase this? Hopefully it makes sense to you that if we divide it by say two meters, then the wavelength, sorry, the distance over which it would, uh, over which it would, uh, repeat itself would be four pi. So we want to divide by lambda meters. If, if we divided by lambda meters, then it would repeat itself over two pi lambda. So maybe we multiply by two pi, divide by lambda, and that'll get us the correct result. So it turns out the fix to this problem is cosine of two pi x divided by lambda plus 2 pi t divided by capital T, the period. So clearly this is unitless. Sorry, 2 pi vt. No, that's actually not correct. I should have, um, yeah, I could have 2 pi t, or I could have 2 pi, let's do this, vt divided by lambda. That's correct. I just multiply, I just divided the whole argument the x plus vt, I just divided both things by lambda and multiplied by pi. Now, I mean, I'm clearly changing the function here, but this is, this is the function that we wanted to describe. Now, if you replace x with lambda and you look at t equals zero, you'll see that you get cosine of two pi back. And that means that it will repeat itself every lambda meters. So this is unitless, check. It has wave-like behavior. It has the, uh, we could factor out the two pi over lambda and you get x plus vt. So this is still a wave. That's a check. Now we can make a note here. V over lambda. Well, we know that that is from our previous equations up top, scrolling up. We could, V over lambda is f. It's the frequency. And so <clears throat> what is the frequency? The frequency is one over T. So already we could replace the V over Lambda with a T. That's what I was doing before. And that's why things got a little bit messy. Now, this is great. This would describe something that repeats itself every Lambda meters and it replaces, repeats itself every uh, V over T or cap or sorry, V over Lambda or T units of time. But what it doesn't tell us is, is it still tells us that the peak always starts at, uh, at the same place, right? If you plug in x and t equals zero, you always get this peak here. But what if, what if it doesn't start off at a peak? What if it starts off at a trough or at a zero? Well, what do you do? I.e., what if we want to move the peak? Because that's a totally sensible thing to ask.
well, there's a fix that we can add to that. And by the way, what we're doing is we're building up the most general form of a harmonic wave. What we can do is we can add a phase constant. So phase constant, new word or new phrase, um, it has, has the Greek letter phi associated with it or phi. Uh, some people will write it like that. I always use the circle with a line through it. So what we do is we just write f of x and t. Now we can write it as cosine of 2 pi x over lambda plus 2 pi vt over lambda plus just phi. It's just, it's just a number, or more particularly, it's an angle. And so what that gives us now is that f of 0 and 0, when x and t are both 0, this is equal to cosine of phi which is not necessarily one unless, i.e. When, when cosine of, when your function is one, then that's when you're at your peak, right? Because cosine has a maximum value of one. Unless phi is two pi or four pi or whatever, right? If you add a phase constant that's just a multiple of two pi, then yes, of course, you just, you're not changing anything. There's one more thing that we haven't, that we haven't uh, thought about that we can change with our um, with our function. What if, what if our wave actually is, say, say our wave is a, a, a displacement on a string, right? Well, what if it's not moving one meter upwards, say? What if it's moving five centimeters upwards? How do we figure out how high this function goes, right? Well, we can just multiply the whole function by a number, right? So if the peak is taller than one unit, or if it has units at all, or smaller, then all we do is we just multiply by whatever the maximum height is. We have A called the amplitude times cosine of 2 pi x over lambda plus 2 pi vt over lambda plus phi. This A here, this is called the amplitude. And it basically tells you what the maximum amount of your disturbance is. Like if your string gets up to a maximum height above like where the level of the string is at like five centimeters, then you would multiply your whole cosine by five centimeters. Um, and so, so basically these four parameters, um, A, lambda, V, and phi, those characterize entirely a harmonic wave. They tell us precise, and I suppose whether or not this is a plus or a minus, that also tells you the direction. Those entirely tell you the shape, the size, the rate, all of the things about a harmonic wave that you need to know. Uh, just as a quick aside, um, we use a cosine instead of a sine, but we didn't have to. However, recall from basic trig that sine of theta plus pi over two, that's just equal to cosine of theta, right? So the only difference between, um, between a, a sine and a cosine is that this, this number phi is different. By the way, there's another name that we give for the whole argument inside here that we'll see pop up. So the argument, I don't know why it's called the argument, by the way. It's just a historical name. The argument, uh, 2 pi x over lambda plus 2 pi vt. And by the way, that plus could be a minus just as well. Plus phi, this is called capital phi. It's just a bigger phi with the, what lines up top and bottom. That's called, it, it is the argument or the total phase of the wave. It basically tells you, look, at a particular place and time, x and t, where in the, what, what part of the cycle will it be at? If that phi is 2 pi, that means it's at its starting place. If it's 4 pi, it's at its starting place again. If it's pi, then it's halfway, because you know a whole, one whole cycle is 2 pi radians. So this whole business, this phi, by the way, all of these things are in radians. I should have said that from the get-go. Um, like this phi, is, it's an angle and it's in radians. 
because cosines and sines take in radians. This phi just tells you what part of the wave's oscillation are you at at a given position and time. Um, and so once we start talking about interference, we will talk about this total phase pretty frequently. Now let me show you another uh, moving picture, another GIF. Um, oh, I can move this thing. OK, well, that helps. I can move the, uh, the floating controls. Uh, maybe I can't. So let me stop sharing really quick, just so I can show you something. Or a new share, actually. Uh, let's share this, this screen. So this is an example of a harmonic wave. And so what we can do is I can show you, with the power of animation, um, what happens when you adjust these values. So right now, notice that the direction is set to left. Oh, where'd it go? The direction is set to left, so the wave is clearly moving to the left. I can adjust the wavelength. If I make the wavelength bigger, oh, this is a lot harder to do with a tablet. Come on. Let me plug it in really quick or get my, uh, connect my key. Right, so if I adjust the wavelength, if I make it smaller, now it repeats over a smaller distance, right? If I make it bigger, it repeats over a larger distance. I think my audio is, no, my audio is good. Um, similarly, I can adjust the period. This is how long it takes to repeat itself. Notice, by the way, that what it'll do if I make the period smaller, it'll go faster. It'll repeat itself every three seconds. If I make, the, if I make it slower, now, if, so it'll repeat itself every nine seconds now. I can also adjust the phase constant. This just tells me where in the, uh, let me actually pause this so you can see this. Oh, pause. Pause. Yeah, yeah, there, I'll, I'll provide links to all of these. So this phase constant tells me where in the cycle I am. So it just lets me shift it back and forth. The equilibrium tells me how much higher or lower than the, say, if this is a string, it just shifts it up and down. I didn't talk about that because it's not super relevant. And this amplitude will tell me how big the oscillation is. So all of these things control the standard shape of a wave, or the standard shape of a harmonic wave, rather. Um, <clears throat> so those are, those are your default parameters, as it were. Now let's get back to the lecture. Oh, there we go. Um, new share. Sorry for all these technical difficulties, by the way. My tablet, I think it's just getting old. Nope, not that. There we go. I mean, I've, I did this before. Uh, last quarter, though. Um, I had less animation, so it was running more smoothly. Uh, I, yeah, I, I did it in spring, but it's just a bit of a mess. Um, right. So those are the different ways that you can uh, get, uh, th that you can adjust a harmonic wave. It just adjusts it in various ways. Now, I've talked a lot about this wave speed. It says low system resources may affect your video quality. Oh, let me close out of that, uh, that program then, so that maybe it'll run a little bit more smoothly. OK, there we go. Uh, oh, is the audio and video quality OK? OK, so I talked, I've talked a lot about wave speed. But I haven't told you what determines wave speed. Now, a lot of things will, will have different reasons for why their wave speed is what it is. However, we can do a relatively straightforward derivation. And this will be posted online as well. Actually, it's in the textbook of what determines wave speed for a string, like a piece of string that's just oscillating up and down, right? So let's do an example of a derivation of the wave speed. So here we have a transverse. Remember, the transverse means it's perpendicular to the motion. Transverse wave on a string. And so the thing to think about is like you have a person, um, and they're holding onto a string, and they're wiggling that string up and down, right? And maybe it's connected to a wall on the other end or something like that. So what affects the rate at which these waves move? 
we can derive that using Newton's laws, actually. So let's just zoom in on a very little chunk, right? So say that this is this piece of the string. Say it has length. Let me make it a little bit thicker so it's a little bit easier to see. Say this piece of the string has length delta x. And it's, we're going to take the limit where delta x goes to 0 at the end of the day. But this is just a small length of string. Now, we know that, there's go that one part of the string is going to pull up on it with some force f2 here. And another part of the string will pull on it in that direction, say force f1. Right, that, that, those are the only forces on the string. I mean, there's gravity, but ignoring gravity. Um, the, uh, the, the only forces acting on the string are the other parts of string, pulling on it in various directions, right? We can break up this force into a horizontal and vertical force. Similarly, let me actually make this at a slight angle so that it's more obvious. Similarly, we can break up these forces, F1, F2. So first, we know something about the tension, right? So remember that the tension in a string, this is, remember this from 9a, the tension in a string, call it, say, F, is just, it's just how hard is being pulled on the string. Now, we think of tension as the horizontal pulling. The tension shouldn't have anything to do with how the string's moving up and down. So this is F1 in the x direction, and it's also equal to F2 in the x direction. And that's because for, you know, a standard string, the, the individual part of the string, um, <clears throat> the tension should be the same on either end. Now, that's not generally true. It does change a little bit. But as delta x goes to 0, the tensions will be the same on either end. It'll experience the same force uh, to the left and to the right. Now, from Newton's second law, um, we know that uh, if we don't want the string to accelerate to the left or right, which it shouldn't, it should only be moving up and down, we have that f net in the x direction should be equal to 0, which is equal to f1, f1x, which is f2x. So, so sorry, um, f1x minus f2x. So this is kind of a proof that those two tensions should be the same. If we don't want the string to be moving left or right, then those tensions have to be the same. Now, let's look at the Newton's second law in the y direction. The force in the y direction, well, this is going to be, we have F2y going up, and we have minus F2, sorry, F1y going down. Right? That's, that's just the force in the y direction. And this should be equal to the mass of that, that chunk of string times the acceleration in the vertical direction of that chunk of string. Now, the mass, well, if we know the density of the string and we know the length of the string, we can figure out the mass. So this mass is mu, it's linear mass density. By the way, this derivation is also in the textbook. I prefer the derivation I'm doing, but it's basically the same. Times delta x. Right, it's just mass times distance because it's linear density. And the acceleration, well, that's just the, the second derivative of position. So this is uh, mu times delta x times d squared y dt squared. Right, that's what acceleration is. Now, what's next? There's also, some, uh, there's also something that we can say regarding the slope of these, uh, the slope of the string at position one and position two. Now you'll see why this comes up in a minute. So the slope at position one, that's just equal, like the slope of the string itself, that's equal to the ratio of the forces, right? Because the force points in the direction of the slope. So this is equal to, I need to make sure I get, uh, well, these are just magnitudes of things. They're not going to be, uh, they're not going to be directional. This is the rise over run. So it is F1y divided by F1x, which is just F1y divided by F, right? We called the horizontal components of the force just F. And similarly, for the slope at 2, this is F2y divided by F. I know that this is strange. Um, I promise we will, uh, I'll, I'll explain why that's true. Let's, uh, <clears throat> let's now use, these, use this data to figure out what we know 
about these vertical for these vertical forces. By the way, the slope at position one that should just be the the position derivative of um, of the string, right? Like that is like if you describe the string's pos position mathematically, it would be this the position derivative. Similarly, this is dy two dx. That's what slope slope is the derivative of the same thing. So we can solve for f one y and f two y, right? In particular, f2y minus f1y, that's equal to f times dy2 dx minus dy1 dx. OK, so far so good. Um, and so we can combine that with Newton's second law. We know, so now we have a difference between the vertical forces, and we know we have a formula for those. So we get that <coughs> f times dy2 dx minus dy1 dx is equal to mu delta x times d squared y dt squared. And that y could be a y1 or y2 because they're very close to each other. And so let's divide through by delta x. Well, this thing becomes a derivative then, right? You take the difference between the two values and you divide by the distance between them. That is the limit definition of a derivative. So this, this becomes f times d squared y dt squared equals mu times d squared y dt squared. And now we can divide by f and we get d squared y dt squared. Sorry, that shouldn't be a t, that should be an x. Equals mu over f times d squared y dt squared. And this is the wave equation, right? It's a second derivative with respect to space is equal to a number times the second derivative with respect to time. In this case, we find that the speed from our formula for the, remember it was one over v squared, d squared f dt squared. And we had d squared f dx squared over here. This tells us that the speed is the square root of f divided by mu. So what we did is we, using Newton's second law, we derived not only the wave equation, we also derived the speed of the wave on a string and how it depends on the various quantities of the string. In particular, it depends on how heavy the string is, and it depends on how hard you're pulling on the string, what the tension in that string is. I know that this, that this was a really quick derivation, and I apologize for that. Uh, but again, it, it is in the textbook. so you should be able to find it relatively straightforward and go over it, spend some more time on it. So let me just summarize what some wave attributes are and where they come from. So uh, some, some, of the, some of the attributes of the wave, like the, um, like the wavelength, that depends on what's causing the wave to happen, right? If you flick a string very slowly, it'll have a very long wavelength or a very long period. If you flick a string faster, it'll have a shorter period. But nothing you can do will affect the speed of the wave. So in particular, the wave speed is a property of the medium. It only depends on the thing that the wave is traveling through. It doesn't depend on anything that you do. Nothing you can do can make the wave travel faster on the string. Nothing you can do regarding like the actual cause of the wave. The amplitude, on the other hand, It depends on the power, I'm going to put power in quotes here, of the driver, i.e. how hard are you flicking the string up and down? That certainly does depend. That, that doesn't depend on the medium. It doesn't depend on the string. It depends on you. It depends on what's causing the wave. Similarly, the period depends on the rate of cycling of the driver. So it depends on how quickly you're oscillating your hand up and down as you're flicking the string back and forth. And the wavelength, well, we know the wavelength depends on both the speed and the period. So it depends on, depends on both the medium and the driver. So there are some things in a wave that you can change. You could change the period, you could change the amplitude, but you can't change the wave speed, right? For example, the speed of sound and air it's always the speed of sound and air. Like, it doesn't matter how loud you yell, it's still gonna get to someone at the same time. So 
there, there is this kind of separation into where these phenomena or where these uh, attributes come from. And that's all I was trying to get across. Wave speed, for example, depends only on the medium. Like it depends on the tension in the string and on the linear mass density of the string, right? So you can't really change that very easily. What you can change is you can change the frequency, for example. Um, right, so that was just a little bit of an aside uh, about harmonic waves and so on and so forth. Um, I want to now kind of change gears and talk about um, energy and amplitude and power and intensity and things like that. Still regarding waves, but we're going to talk about how they can be used to like transmit energy. So power transmit, so I'm just going to give this a header. So I think I'm wearing off the skin on my pinky because I'm using it to rest on. Yeah, I am. See. Um, so power transmission, uh, intensity, and amplitude. How are all of these things related? Right, we know waves can transmit power. For example, we know light's a wave, and like you can send energy, like, like a laser, for example, transmits heat energy. It transmits power from where the laser is to the thing that it's shining on. So hopefully recall, or if you, or if you didn't learn this in 9A, hopefully you can imagine that the energy in a spring system is the, uh, the total energy in the spring system is one half times the spring's um, rigidity times the amplitude of the oscillation squared. Now that should be fairly straightforward, right? The energy in a spring system is kinetic plus potential energy. And if you want to find the total energy and you don't want to relate it at all to the kinetic energy, just look where the kinetic energy is zero. The kinetic energy is zero at the top or at the bottom of the spring oscillation, right? And that's where the, ampli that's where the position is at its maximum amplitude. So the total energy is just one half times k times the amplitude squared, where the amplitude is the distance from equilibrium, as it were. But how does this relate to waves? Well, turns out that you can treat you can treat each point in a medium like a, like a simple oscillator, like a spring. And let me draw a quick picture. Like, if this is your string, you can imagine the little particles on your string being attached to springs, and they're all oscillating up and down in sync. I'm not going to draw all of them. Something like this, right? Now, what's really happening is actually they're being pulled on on the left and on the right, or uh, like they're being pulled on by their neighboring pairs, but it has the same effect. However, there are no actual springs, right? Like, the, like there are no physical springs causing this. It's just material properties and electrical forces and so on and so forth. So how do we get this K out? If we want to, I mean, intuitively, you would ask, well, the energy in the wave is just, uh, you just add up the total energy of all of these springs. But the K is not something that's well defined for a wave. It's not just like a value that you can just go out and measure because there's not actual springs. So we need to relate this K to something that we can measure. So recall, again, maybe you didn't learn this, but it is true for a spring, a spring oscillating system, omega, which is the angular frequency, and I'll, I'll get to that in a little bit. Um, actually, I should have already covered that. Hopefully you guys know omega is angular frequency. But if you don't know, now you do. And it's, it's literally just two, times pi times f, where f is the regular frequency. The angular frequency of a spring is k divided by m. Or we could also write k as m times 2 pi f squared. So that's just a true fact. If you didn't learn it in 9a, uh, especially if you took it with me, I didn't get to spring oscillations. That's OK. Take this as, uh, take this as true. Then we get that the total energy of a spring is 1 half times the mass attached to the spring times the angular frequency of the spring squared times the amplitude squared. This is for a string wave, for example.
So if you wanted to find the total energy of the wave, you would just um, <clears throat> add up the mass of all of the individual parts on the wave. Sorry, the energy of in the individual parts on the wave. But notice that I just included the mass here. That's the mass of the whole string, not just the mass of an individual part. And it turns out, because they all have the same frequency and they all have the same amplitude, all you're doing is you're just adding up the masses of all the chunks. And it, it factors nicely to get that this is the total energy of a wave on a string, where m is the mass of the string. So where does that, how does that energy like go places? Because power transmission is about taking energy in one place and moving it to another place, right? So on a string, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. OK, there we go. Um, energy is transferred down the string. It's transferred in the direction of motion, right? The way that the wave is traveling. So maybe before, we have something like this, where you have maybe a little oscillation in your wave moving to the right. And then later, we have the same wave, but now it's over here, right? So what you've done is you've taken some energy that was here, and you've moved it to over there. That's, that's power transmission, right? Like that, that, is what, that is what it means to transmit energy. You take power over, or you take energy over here, and you move it over there. So how much energy is stored in a single wavelength? Well, we can figure out the mass of a wavelength, right? Remember that, the, that this is the energy stored in a chunk of string with mass m. If that's the whole string, great. If it's not the whole string, it's just whatever chunk of mass has that, um, whatever chunk of string has that mass m. So the energy, so we just need to figure out what the mass of a wavelength is. But that's relatively easy. Let me actually write that out. The mass of a wavelength, remember in the derivation above, the linear mass density is just like the total mass divided by the total length. So if you wanted the mass of a wavelength, you would just take the linear mass density and multiply it by a wavelength. It tells you how many kilograms per foot or per meter or whatever. So the energy then, in a single wavelength, we just substitute the mass in the formula above for this mass of a single wavelength. It's 1 half times mu times 2 pi f squared times a squared times lambda. Um, that's, we're just finding the mass of a total wavelength and plugging it in. So that tells us how much energy is in a wavelength. And if we can figure out how fast that energy is delivered, how many wavelengths appear per minute or something, that will tell us the power transmission, like how much power is transmitted. That's basically asking the question, how fast is energy delivered? Which is just power, as I said. So we know that it takes, it takes t, which is the period, seconds, to deliver one full wavelength. Worth of energy, right? Um, that makes sense. One wavelength will travel, sorry, one wavelength will travel one wavelength's worth of distance in a full, in one period. That's, that's how all of those things are related. So we, we know then the rate at which these wavelengths are arriving. Like a single wavelength will arrive every uh, period amount of seconds. So the power, which is just energy divided by time, this is just 1 half times mu. I'm just writing it out, uh, writing out the first part, times the, uh, well, 2 pi f squared times a squared. And then we just take lambda, and now we divide it by t, because it's just, it's just energy over time. But lambda over t is the velocity. So this is, that is, the power of the wavelength or the power of, a, of just a wave, not a single wavelength, is the following. So it depends on the wave speed, it depends on the frequency, and it depends on, depends on the amplitude. Um, so, the, and in fact, that's actually, the, well, that, that's true for strings. And we know how the wave speed depends on the, on the string properties, like on the things like the tension force and the linear mass density. 
uh, that's what that's the derivation that we did earlier. Um, v is square root of the force of tension divided by mu. So the power for a wave on a string is one half times the square root of mu times f tension. I'm just simplifying here times 2 pi f squared times a squared. And there you go. Now, why did I do all of this? Well, first of all, the way I've written this depend, all, all of the quantities here um, are either properties of the wave or of the, of the medium itself, or they depend on the driver. Now, for a given string with a given amount of tension on it, you can choose how much power to transmit by changing things with your driver, by changing the frequency that you set that you oscillate, by changing the amplitude of your oscillation. Those things are under our control. We can't really affect the tension or the medium, assuming that you can't pull harder on the string. But, but the point is, is the parts that control the power depend only on, on information that you get from the driver of the wave. Now, something that's important is that the power transmission is proportional to a squared. And that's not like all of this, all of this stuff we've done. This is about strings, like string waves. But this statement that the power transmission is proportional to a squared, this is true for all waves. All waves, if you double the amplitude, you quadruple the power transmission. Um, like that's that's just a true a true statement, and it's something to you know tuck away into the back of your head. It's important. Well, sorry, it's true for all one-dimensional waves. This is waves that travel in a single direction, not waves that like spread out. Which segues us nicely, actually, to the next idea. These are we we can talk about two D or three D waves, right? Waves don't just travel in a single direction. Think of like throwing a a pebble into a pond, right? Um, the waves will ripple out, and those really are waves. Like they travel at a fixed rate. Um, there, it's a little bit more complicated because they dissipate because there's friction and so on. But in an ideal world, energy, and you guys learned this in 9a, energy is always, I'm putting that in quotes because ideal world and all that, conserved. So the question is, if it was true that the power transmission was always proportional to, a, to the amplitude squared, you guys know that like when you chuck a pebble into a lake, the waves start off higher, but then they get lower. That would indicate that the power transmission was like started off high and got lower, but that can't happen because power transmission is just the rate that energy moves. It can't be that that energy is just sitting around. That energy has to still be contained in the wave as it moves forward. So the idea here is that we cannot just rely on amplitude squared to get the power transmission for higher dimensional waves because the energy from a wave, the energy from a wave is constant, even if it's spread out. So just a quick little gif of this. Nope, wrong one. Nope, wrong one. Uh, here it is, new share. So uh, clear. So this is just like a drum that I'm just going to poke, right? So mouse should uh, strike membrane. So look at how the waves propagate. Notice how it goes, how it's, uh, it's not very central. Poke the middle. Initially, you have, a high, you have a high magnitude, but then it spreads out and goes lower. And so while the energy is conserved, the amplitude is changed. Now, this is complicated because it's reflecting off the edges. But just imagine, just see what happens as it goes away, as it moves outwards. The amplitudes are getting lower as they move outwards, and then you know they're bouncing back and coming up. But the idea is the same, and it's just like a ripple in a pond. The waves will get smaller, but you still have the same amount of energy. And the basic reason for that is because even though you have, even though your amplitude is smaller, you have more area over which that amplitude is spread. So if you were to integrate to find the total energy, you would be the same. Um, 
So let me write that out in words for you guys. The amplitude decreases, amplitude decreases to account for energy spreading out over a larger area. And that certainly happens, right? Hopefully your everyday experience with waves agrees with that. But that means that we can have a new quantity. We can, we can talk about a new thing. Power perhaps isn't the correct way to characterize um, <clears throat> a wave, because if we want to talk about what relates the, uh, what's related to the wave's amplitude, we should somehow be able to relate the thing that we see, like the height of the wave, to something that decreases, because that thing that decreases is the thing we observe. So we introduce a new quantity. It's called intensity. And it is the density of power flux. So I say density. It could be area density. It could be volume density. I'm not going to go into details. Well, I will go into details, but it matters what, how many dimensions you're in. So an example of a 2D wave, by the way, would be something like um, a, a rock thrown into a, into a pup, uh, puddle, right? Because that just spreads out in two dimensions. But like, if you just shout in a room, that would be a three-dimensional wave. It spreads out in all the directions. So the intensity is differently defined in those two different cases. For a two-dimensional two wave, the intensity as a function of distance Remember that, remember that we used in 9a, we used r to indicate distance from something. In this case, r is the distance of, from the source. This is the power delivered by the source. Think of the rate at which the pebble delivered energy to the water, divided by the circumference of the circle. So we know that the rock delivers some amount of energy to the water. And then that, that energy is then delivered outwards in the form of waves. But we know that the, that, that, that like the amount of uh, energy that's delivered gets like some, somehow in like the same size area gets smaller as it gets further away because you know it's more spread out. So what this intensity does is it basically formalizes that idea. You basically take the total um, you take the total power, this is the power delivered by the source, in this case, the rock falling into the water, and you divide it by how much, in this case, length, that power is spread out over, right? You take all of that power, it was concentrated in one place, but then it spreads out over an ever-increasing circle. It spreads out with the size of the wave, or the size of the ripples. So this r that you divide by, or this 2 pi r, that is the circumference of the, of the circle that you are interested in finding the intensity of. So like if Let's say that you have you throw your rock into into the puddle. If you want to find the intensity of the wave, say this distance out, you divide by the circumference of that circle. If you want to find the intensity that far out, you divide by the circumference of that circle. And you'll notice that even though the power stays the same, the intensity drops off. And that's not surprising because the intensity should be the thing that is related to the amplitude. Um, for three dimensions, it's very similar. It's just a little bit harder to draw. The intensity also depends on the distance from the source. But in this case, it's the power delivered by the source divided by 4 pi r squared. This is the surface area of the sphere. So imagine shouting in a room. If you wanted to figure out the intensity, which is related to loudness, by the way, if you wanted to figure out the intensity of the uh, sound wave that's traveling outwards, you would figure out how much power I delivered with my voice. And then, you would and then you would figure out, okay, how far away am I actually from that source? Well, if you're say 10 meters away, all of that power is spread out over a sphere of radius 10 meters. So the intensity that gets to your ear, which is what you then measure, you would have to take the total power and divide it by the surface area of a sphere with radius 10 meters. So you divide it by 40 or, or by a, 400 pi, because <coughs> the surface area of a sphere is 4 pi r squared. Um, 
And so in fact, this is actually where you get an inverse square law for say light propagation and sound propagation from 3D waves. The intensity drops off with the radius squared. I don't know why I'm writing so poorly right now. So we can rewrite this a different way. R1 squared times the intensity at a distance R1 is equal to R2 squared times the intensity at a distance R2. So there is something, something that's like conserved. Oh, I think that I'm lagging. Um, no, I think I'm good. There's something that's like conserved here. It's this R squared times I, sub, uh, uh, times I of R. And we're not going to write a conservation law for that, but it is, a, it is an important, or it is an interesting uh, idea, and it sh it's, it's relevant because it, it, it tells us exactly why the intensity of a sound wave uh, decreases by a factor of four when you double the distance. This is why things get quieter as you get further away. Now, um, that, I, I'm just going to put that all aside. That was just a useful aside. We needed to talk about intensity and uh, power and all of those things. But we're going to move to a slightly different topic for the, for the last eight minutes or so of lecture. So sorry for, doing, sorry for jumping all over the place, but we do have material to cover. So, so far, we've talked about energy, the energy that a wave transmits. We've talked about what the fundamental properties of a wave are. But let's say you have two waves. What happens when they come together? So this is the idea of superposition. Like, do waves interact with each other? Like, what do they do when they, because like, you can scream and I can scream, and then what happens in the middle, right? So, <clears throat> one might ask the question similarly, how do we change the magnitude of the wave, or the magnitude of a, wave, of a single wave? Well, it's a trick question, because you don't. You just take two waves and you add them together. So here's a picture, uh, a quick little video that I'll show you. Again, I'm going to do a new share, uh, this thing. So we have a wave on the left moving to the right uh, and uh, a wave on the right moving left. And we can see what happens when the two waves come together and add together. You can see that the amplitude actually increases as they pass over each other. It, the amplitude becomes double of what it was. So if you have any two waves, let me go back to my lecture. Let's pause this. If you have two waves, then it's fair to, oh, it's fair to write that you could just add up those two wave functions. This could be F1 of X and T plus F2 of X and T. You can just add up waves. Wait, so all waves do when they interact with each other, when they say you scream and I scream, is that when they overlap, all they do is whatever disturbance one produced is added to whatever disturbance the other one produced at that same instant and location. They're just literally added together. Um, and so superposition is just this phenomenon that waves tend to add. And by add, I mean it could be subtract, right? Because you get like one, one wave could have a disturbance in the, neg in the negative direction. One, dis one wave could have a disturbance in the positive direction, and they could add up and cancel out. And in fact, that's precisely this idea of interference. So this is a special case of interference. Superposition always happens. Um, interference is what we call it when two waves interact in a certain way. Oop. So we have two types. We have constructive interference. These are when waves are the waves are perfectly aligned. Then the amplitudes add up. So imagine just stacking two identical waves on top of each other. Well, then their amplitude would just be double the original amplitude. And then you have destructive interference, which is kind of as it sounds. This is when the waves are exactly opposite.
And so when this happens, you have the amplitude decreases. Sometimes, um, <clears throat> sometimes it just goes to zero. But in general, the amplitude is just the new amplitude is just the difference of the old amplitudes. So those are just two special cases. If you have two waves that are perfectly aligned, then they are, you get constructive interference, and two waves that are like aligned but um, are, are perfectly anti-aligned, then you get destructive interference. But what if they're neither perfectly aligned or perfectly anti-aligned, right? What if the waves are identical, meaning they have the same wave speed, the same wavelength, and all of that business, but they're just out of phase? I.e., they have different phase constants. Well, can, we, we can ask the question, what about like what happens to the intensity of the new wave when you add them together? Right, that, that's an interesting question. Clearly, we know that if for a one for a one-dimensional wave, if you have perfect constructive interference of two identical waves, then the amplitude doubles, so the intensity quadruples, right? You have destructive interference of perfectly identical waves, then you just get zero amplitude, so you have zero intensity. What about if you have something in the middle? Well, we can actually handle that. Oh, that's not a T, that was an S. So let's say that let or that delta phi is the phase difference, right? One starts off at some phase and one starts off at another. Delta phi is the, is the difference between those phase constants. And let's call I naught the intensity when they constructively interfere. So suppose that um, they were perfectly overlapping, then phi naught would just be four, four times the initial, uh, four times the intensity of a single one, right? You double the amplitude, quadruple the intensity. Um, then we can ask, uh, how does, if they were just slightly out of phase, how does the intensity change? Clearly, it's just going to be some multiple of I naught. It'll either be more or less. Well, it'll, it'll be less because constructive interference is the most intensity you can get. And in fact, you can just write a formula for this. And it is just a result of trig functions, basically. It's just cosine of, say, x plus delta phi plus cosine of x. You can then just ask, how does the intensity of these two waves change? So you, you would rewrite this as a product. and it's just a bunch of trig identities. I'll skip that though. Um, this is just I naught times cosine squared of delta phi over two. It's a simple formula. And so <clears throat> we, can, we can check that when their phase differences, we can check that this makes sense. When destructive interference occurs, that means that they're perfectly out of phase. Right? That means that when one's at a peak, one's at a trough. So how much? It, so so what would have to be the phase difference between those two? It'd have to be precisely pi. Sorry, I'm. Uh, I know we're out of time. I'll I'll be done in just a minute. Um, the phase difference should be pi because one full cycle is two pi. So if they're perfectly out of sync, then it should be half of that. Um, so that means that delta phi should equal pi. And we know that cosine squared of pi over two because we take pi, we divide it by two, and plug it in, this is equal to zero. So when you have destructive interference, the intensity is zero, check mark. Um, when, you have when you have constructive interference, we know that the phase difference should be zero. These are just literally identical waves. They're completely overlapped. They have no phase difference. So we can check that cosine squared of um, zero divided by two, that's just one. So then the intensity is equal to the intensity when it's, at con when it's constructively interfering. As another check, this is always positive because intensity should always be positive. So <clears throat> I guess we'll, we'll cover standing waves starting next time. But um, I know that I threw a whole lot of information about you. Unfortunately, that's the nature of an online course that ha tends to be really compressed. But the idea behind this, uh, this, phase, this phase difference is it'll let us basically figure out how two waves interact when they have different phase differences. It'll tell us how bright or how loud the, uh, those two waves are. And in fact, this will lead 
to things like dead spots in a room, right? For, and and uh, well, this is just a taste of what we're going to see next time. But for example, if you have uh, two speakers that have the same source, meaning that they're like plugged into the same wire, but maybe they're in different places, one might have to travel longer to get to a certain place than another speaker will. So they'll have a different overall phase by the time they get to that place. And if they destructively interfere, if their phase difference is pi or 3 pi or 5 pi, then you'll have a dead spot. That place will just be really, really quiet because you'll have destructive interference. Similarly, you'll have high volume spots if, you, if those two speakers are constructively interfering at, at, at various places and so on. And so this is a good explanation for why certain acoustic, uh, acoustic building or acoustic properties are the way they are. This will also explain a whole lot about light and so on. So I'm going to stop the recording there. Um, <clears throat> this is what I, what I typically end up doing is I stop the recording.